All right, so welcome back into the live stream today. We're going to be diving into exchanges and also how the crypto market may be faring across the globe. We'll take a look at some clips, take a look at some deep dives on all this. It may play into the overall market and how you're playing out your investment strategy. So stay tuned for sure. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. You know, when I, we were uh, joking around here on the crypto pit earlier, and I was thinking back to uh, Do Kwan. Of course, you guys know who Do Kwan is. And he had this great quote uh, called deploying capital and then steady lads. And of course, now we know Do Kwan is on the run. So just interesting quotes. Those, that will probably go down as one of the greatest quotes on Twitter that was a fail ever in the history. I want to, before we get into it today, though, that's kind of off, off key, but before we get into it today, I want to touch on our sponsor, and that, of course, is iTrust Capital. Let's jump into iTrust Capital. If you guys are looking at, and now we're nearing toward the end of the year, so a lot of people are looking at tax planning, uh, trying to position uh, for maybe a year in which you're maybe doing some tax loss harvesting. There's a lot of different strategies out there. Obviously, a crypto IRA will reduce your overall tax exposure, and it's one of the ways to really look at a long-term strategy. This is the things that I do. Uh, of course, this is something that obviously... I'm not a financial advisor, but you should take a look with your CPA, your accountant, and also maybe even your tax attorney, and take a look at uh, looking into actual crypto IRAs. This may be a great tool for you. There is a cool thing that they are doing right now, of course, and that is the $100 funding reward. All you have to do is use our link that is down in the description below. Lots of tokens, very low trading fees within the IRA itself, and no monthly fees as well. So it's a great value. You guys are looking at going in that direction. Let's get into it today. A couple of things uh, on the aspect of not only exchanges, but also some of the adoption curves that we've been looking at for quite some time. Some of it is around and centered around the banks. Now, banks, I think, will be one of the critical elements that really take off between now and the next happening with Bitcoin. I do believe we're in a very strategic position right now. And unfortunately, I think that we're starting to see a little bit of pressure on some of the exchanges. We'll get into a few things here. I want to jump to this first story that kind of outlines a little bit of what's happening within the established financial system. This, of course, coming in from Coindesk. NASDAQ starts a crypto custody service for institutional clients. This, again, will be a big party for the institutional uh, capital firms. This is something we've talked about many times over on this show, and that is that right now I think we are, are entering into a time in which two things are happening. The first thing is that we're entering into the potential bottom of the market. And whether we look at different regulation, we look at scenarios that will play out on the economic front from pressures from the macro side, what will happen from the, uh, the economy side of things, but I think the more important thing to watch right here is who starts to move chess pieces into this downturn. Because this is the time in which we see more millionaires and more people that truly gain huge wealth uh, standards. In other words, adding zeros to your net worth. That is what a mission is, I think, right now in the time we're talking about. And of course, NASDAQ um, dropping in this custody service for institutional clients. I think what this does is it plays into the overall adoption scenario that we've been talking about quite some time, many people think that the adoption may come from retail. I'm kind of on the other side of the fence that we will see adoption more to the aspect of institutional clients that start to move into this space. So interesting move uh, that they have right now. I think this will be a big one for sure. You also have, of course, Robinhood just dropping this on uh, Twitter today, which is USDC is now on Robinhood. Uh, so obviously you're going to see something happen here, I think, with Robinhood very quickly. And that, I think, is going to be the DeFi wallet. Now, they've talked about the DeFi wallet uh, for quite some time. And the plan has been throughout the year is to try to la launch something by the end of the year. If you look at what Vlad is talking about right here, big update. We hit over 1 million signups on the wait list. That's a big deal. Uh, beta testing will commence in the coming weeks. This, of course, was back here in August. Um, and the likelihood around rolling out a DeFi wallet. I'm kind of curious if you guys would look at using something like Robinhood if the DeFi wallet is deployed and it is a way. And number one, I guess the big question for me for, for Robinhood is getting to the point where you can start to move more than $5,000 a day in crypto. That's a big holdback for, at least for me, 
and probably for a lot of you in terms of transferring in and out of Robinhood or utilizing a DeFi wallet in many cases, whether or not they'll start to apply that. USDC does go, I think you can hold it right now, but I think tomorrow is the date where you'll actually be able to send and receive uh, within the Robinhood app. And again, this is another major play into what is traditional exchanges and trading houses starting to move into the space of crypto. And this gets to the point that I'm talking about, and that is how major banks, major investment uh, capacities will start to move into the space and whether or not we will see exchanges actually hold up to the pressure coming in from institutions. Now, there are going to be some, uh, I think, some roadblocks here. I'll talk to you about a, a few of those. First, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Coinbase. And this is in reference to their update on their fees. This came, of course, for September. And there's a couple of things here I highlighted. One is lowering the monthly trading volume required to qualify for mid and upper tiers of the fee schedule. This is a big deal because the mid and upper tiers were somewhat unachievable in the past. And now they've got it to where it is, it's a little bit more reasonable. And it definitely goes into a much lower trading cost uh, that I think over time will really position them uh, in a better way. Now, whether or not they can handle uh, exchanges and other entities out there starting to go to zero fees is the big question, and we'll talk a little bit about what they said about that. But if you look at here at their chart, here's their tiers right now. This is the new fee schedule on Coinbase. So you've got basically uh, 60 basis points there, plus 40 on the maker fee. Uh, overall, that's a 1%. That's a zero to 10K uh, tier trade. Uh, then you get into the 10 to 50K. Now you're talking about 65 basis points, so just over a half a percent. And then rolling up to a 50K to 100K trade, uh, which is now at 40 basis points, so less than half a percent in uh, terms of their uh, trading fees. And that to me is a big critical uh, area. I think that 50 to 100K is a critical area because there's a lot of wallets that start to fall into that category. And it is one that I think could play out in a benefit for Coinbase, especially if they start to gain more and more users moving off of store or you know, hardware wallets and uh, cold storage into exchanges when they're trying to do trades. And I think this will be a good move for uh, Coinbase. But if you can kind of look at it right here, I mean, this all, all goes down to even negative um, plus one uh, basis point. I mean, we're talking about some really good fees here in the higher tiers, which has, has pretty much always been the case for Coinbase. But I definitely uh, kind of think what, what's happening now is we're starting to see a lot of OTC level uh, potentials here for sure. Now, could they jump to a zero trading fee would be the question that I have. Because if you're going to compete with Robinhood, it's a big deal. And this, of course, kind of goes into it. No plan to go to zero fees. I wonder how long this will hold. Let me zoom in on this. This is Coinbase's COO, Emil Choi. Uh, she says, this is basically not going to be in our play. Uh, we're not going to do it. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a scenario where you're just marching down to zero, and that's never really a great scenario. Uh, she told uh, the audience over at the Goldman Sachs um, event right there that they're not engaging in a battle on the price forefront. Uh, there's a bunch of issues with zero uh, fees, and the big one, of course, is wash trading, which you guys know, but I think a lot of people look at Robinhood and other trading houses out there that have gone to zero fees. The likelihood, I think, at crypto is going to get to this space is real. The question will be, will it come from traditional finance uh, services, banks, and others that start to really put the pressure on a lot of these exchanges? Uh, the other thing that's happening is uh, regulation. If you look at uh, scenarios on regulation, this of course being the UK. Uh, this is the FCA, which is their kind of their SEC uh, that warns consumers about the situation with FTX. This is a problem for FTX. Now remember that uh, Binance is also not uh, approved completely just like what uh, is happening here with, um, with FTX. UK Watchdog warned uh, local consumers that the crypto exchange led by uh, Sam over there, uh, FTX is not authorized to, authorized to operate in the nation. Uh, the regular, uh, the regulator went further, claiming that the platform, of course, now is targeting people in the UK, while investors are unlikely to get their money back if things go wrong. So this is a big statement by the FCA uh, within the UK, and I think this is one that really could put a little bit of a hamper on 
the situation for FTX. Now, my guess is that they're underway like what we saw with uh, CZ. I'll show you a, a little bit of a clip about that, what CZ is doing with Binance in terms of getting regulatory approval in a lot of these different uh, jurisdictions. They go on to talk about that that says the agency required all cryptocurrency prefer- firms that provide services in the UK to meet certain anti-money laundering. Here's the interesting point. Popular exchanges like Kraken and Crypto.com did complete the steps and receive the necessary green light from uh, the FCA. So we know that it's possible. I don't understand why FTX has not moved in this uh, position already. Last year, also, the FCA claimed that Binance Markets Limited, uh, a UK-based subsidiary of Binance, is uh, is not permitted to undertake any regula- regulated activity in the UK. Another one, which we've talked about before, is the scenario with Binance. Now you've got the two market leaders out there, essentially FTX and Binance, that are somewhat we- restricted from being able to operate in what is, I think, one of the uh, best markets out there, that being the UK. So big one to watch for sure. Last year, of course, they claimed that Binance Markets um, uh, was not per- permitted to operate, but also Binance uh, hired more personnel, rolled out a mandatory know your customer. This is the KYC requirements that we've seen. And another thing that we've seen even here in the United States with Binance is the level of the KYC requirements have been pretty strict. Um, we, I do a couple of coachings uh, here in our local community around uh, high net worth individuals, and that has been one of the scenarios that has come back. I've talked about this a little bit more on the show, is that there has been a bit of a threshold entry point of you know easy people that would could open million-dollar bank accounts but can't get a Binance trading account open. Uh, but however, this has recently changed, and I've noticed this with several new signups that I've helped with uh, for major investors that are started to go into Binance here on Binance US. So maybe there's something happening right now with where Binance is going. If you look at this video right here, this was done by uh, Rand from Crypto Banter when he, uh, when he was over in uh, Paris at the Blockchain Week, and he was talking to CZ, and I want to play this clip real quick for you on what CZ had to say about regulatory scenarios. It was clear that at some point Binance and you personally went through a shift and said, Okay, now it's time for us to focus on becoming the cleanest shop in town. Yeah. And I think you you became the cleanest shop in town. Very strange in terms KYC, taking yeah. on people, multi, no one with multiple accounts or trying to limit multiple accounts on the platform. Yeah. How have the regulators and the legislators taken to, to Binance and, and to crypto? How hard has this battle been? Um, so I think it's been a hard battle for sure. Um, it takes a lot of work. A lot, uh, um, and I've been flying around meeting with the regulators uh, 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 a lot. Um, but I think we've seen the results. Um, the results are also quite obvious. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples, right? So um, last year in July, um, Italy, Consob, issued a war- consumer warning with Binance, Binance name, name on it, saying we're not licensed to operate in the country. Guess what? By May this year, so less than 10 months, they give us a registration. So that's the sh- and Spain, same thing. Um, spend France also. France. France never gave us a warning. So just, just gave you the uh, yeah, so, yeah. So Italy gave us a warning like you no know, ten months earlier, and then ten months later they gave us a registration. Um, Spain same warning with less than a year registration. So we we were able to make that shift. France um, no previous warning, but no no licenses either. Uh, with the first license in France. So. All right, so what, uh, what CZ goes on to state there is that they've been able to achieve a lot within Europe in terms of industry standards around regulatory appeasement. I think this is something that is a very difficult thing to overcome within the UK, and there's a process. Also, I think there's a certain level of hierarchy from the FCA there in the UK. So it's going to be interesting to see how FTX and Binance play out the UK because the UK is super important to obviously the crypto space, as is Germany and other. Now, he mentioned Spain, uh, France, um, et cetera. And I think the scenario there with a lot of the European nations is that the more that Binance rolls in, gets the approval, we would start to see kind of a domino effect really applying. He also talked about, I think, 46 states in the United States, obviously through Binance US. So this is all a good sign overall The bigger sign to me is how all of this plays out from an aspect of how the banks are going to get involved. Now, prior to our research on this, 
I was feeling that the banks were maybe a, a step or two ahead of what was happening within the competition. There has been some recent research that was revealed that showed otherwise. Now, I still am a little bit skeptical as to whether or not this is real in the sense that our banks are truly maybe pulling the gas off or are they simply trying to kind of play a little bait and switch? In other words, kind of just don't tell everybody what we're doing right now. Let's kind of keep everybody at arm's length. This story right here from Reuters uh, talking about the U.S. SEC's crypto guidelines push up the cost for lenders disrupting uh, projects. Now, uh, some of these projects, because this is kind of boiling into uh, where banks' cryptocurrency projects have basically been upended by what's happening over at the SEC that would make it too capital intensive for lenders to hold crypto tokens on behalf of the clients. A slew of lenders, including uh, Bancorp, uh, Goldman Sachs is in here, JP Morgan, BNY. Uh, you can kind of see Wells Fargo. There's a, a whole lineup here. And uh, basically what they're saying is that it would really start to thwart whether or not they could even hold these in a profitable standpoint because of the regulatory guidelines that would require them to hold them as liabilities on their balance sheet. So this to me is a big setback. Now, I at the same time, I look at this and think, hmm, this is a short-lived situation, I believe, because we are looking at, I believe, a situation where we're going to see a shift in the balance of power in D.C. and probably put the Republicans in in uh, the House and the Senate in a way in which they're very pro-capitalism, and I think they will lean into what's happening within the banking industry and a lot of the uh, lobbyists that surround the bank uh, industry and the you know the complex out there. I think a lot of this is going to be short-lived and maybe positioning the banks in a better position than maybe they're actually uh, portraying right here. This goes into it right here. The SEC moves complicates efforts to jump on the digital asset bandwagon and could keep them on the sidelines. Keyword here, could. Uh, even as they report increased demand from clients looking to access the burgeoning market. Let me tell you something about banks. Is that when customers are starting to push into this mode, and when they start moving assets, trust me, the banks know when you're moving major assets. And if you're a, let's say you're, a, you know, you're in a bank and maybe you only have $10,000, maybe you only have $1,000 in that bank, you start to move things in and out of these accounts. Typically, the bank starts to notice, especially in higher volume uh, assets and higher volume accounts. That is something that um, I think is going to be caught very quickly. And we're going to start to see some big pressures coming in on the banks themselves to be able to move in this direction. So um, I think this is a short-lived period uh, for the banks. And if anything, I think it's probably a situation that they're actually piling this on as potential ammunition for their lobbyists to be able to position a better uh, scenario from the regulators to be able to deal with this. So a lot of stuff happening out there uh, in this area uh, as we go forward, for sure. Here, of course, is that uh, FTX U.S. president, uh, and he's talked about this before, is that the crypto space obviously needs greater regulatory clarity. There's some key things he kind of goes into here that I think is important. Uh, when you look at what Brett Harrison has to say, he says, you know, we, we got to get through the landscape, obviously, uh, but crypto is really kind of going to be an overall scenario where we've got to get more clarity, obviously, within the legislative environment. And right now, uh, he states, we have fewer than 30 tokens on our exchange, and we think that's fortunately uh, or unfortunately the long-term play that will work for us until there's better clarity in terms of what registration. This is a problem because it's going to start to limit the opportunities, not only of Americans, but I think in general for investment houses that eventually will have access to some of these uh, tokens that in many cases all of our global counterparts already have access to. So this is a problem in the sense of where we will see the growth and innovation in the whole sector. So um, it's definitely one that I think, I think a lot of people have been looking at this particular um, you know, midterm cycle as being maybe the one that really starts to see the next level. And if you remember, we reported, reported on this uh, just a few days ago where Coinbase actually within their app was showing the status of congressmen and representatives uh, within the app that really kind of gave an outline of what their position was on crypto, including kind of a rating system like an A through F. Um, so interesting example, like a Toomey, 
uh, would get an A and a Senator Warren would get an F. That's the kind of thing that was actually in the app. So it's going to be interesting to watch how all of this will play out because I have a feeling that we are getting into a regulatory scenario and a game of what we will see, especially around what's happening with SEC and Ripple, because I think all this is timing and it's all playing into this next cycle, which will be going into, guess what, 2024, what happens? We have a happening, happening occurring we also have a new presidency occurring. So um, that in itself, I think, all plays into the sign of where maybe the banks are going to be going. This is another thing that came over um, and from Binance. And one of the things that, that happened with Binance here recently was subtly they put out a statement on this NFT KYC. Um, the NFT KYC side of thing, I think, is a very innovative way to possibly go through and know your customer experience, but it's not necessarily a locked-in uh, scenario just yet with Binance, so I think it's coming down the road. It will be something that I think uh, I'm very intrigued with it, and most likely we'll see more news on this, but uh, for you guys, I want you guys to keep an eye on two things here from, first of all, the BSC chain as a whole. Look at the projects that are moving in and around the Binance uh, chain. And then also, if you're not holding a BNB token, this is one that I'm very interested in. It's one that we've had on uh, our top 20 uh, portfolio. It's one that I'm looking at long term. And it's also one that I have a feeling has a lot of similarities to what's happening with Ethereum. So be on the lookout for uh, what BNB is doing. If you are not in that, love to kind of get your feedback. If you like BNB as a token, are you getting it, investing in those types of projects, especially around exchange tokens? I do like Binance uh, as a whole. You also look at this story right here, a Fed's report on digital assets. This was an ICBA poll suggesting consumer skepticism. This again is typical of what happens in market cycles like what we're dealing with right now. One of the things, and let me kind of hi highlight this poll because it's pretty interesting. 71% of voters say investing in cryptocurrency is risky along with other markets, including more than three in five, 62%, who own or have owned crypto. So that was pretty impressive to see that much. 55% of the voters say regulators or regulations in the traditional banking industry make them trust it more. This is whether you do trust banks or not. 46% of voters also say they were aware that cryptocurrencies are not subject to the same regula regulations. That was a bit surprising because I felt like in many cases, I'm, I'm get a chance to coach a lot of people in this space that are very well educated in the financial uh, segments. And in many cases, they're not aware of the regulatory separation of what's happening uh, in crypto. So that's good to know that people are getting more aware of that these regulations are not in place with crypto and it does present a very big opportunity, I think. And that's one of the reasons we talk about it here on this show is because regulation is going to create a certain amount of opportunity. Sure, there's gonna be some limitations that it starts to represent and it will start to get the rich richer. Yes, we know that. But again, being early is one of the key things that we need to uh, continue to look at around all this. More than half voters, half of the voters, 51%, including bipartisan uh, majority, said that the establishment of a U.S. CBDC would increase the risk of their personal financial privacy and security. So this, to me, was also very eye-opening. 51%. At this stage in the game of understanding what a CBDC will really mean to Americans and maybe to the globe since we're looking at potentially the world reserve currency here. That in itself, I think, is the fact that we've got a lot more financial aware people than um, a lot of people give credit for, especially in today's investment class. And then last was uh, nearly two thirds of voters, 64% also, both by bipartisan majority, majority uh, say that they would rather have their personal bank account with a private commercial bank than a Federal Reserve. Pretty clear. I think this is a big step in the right direction based on these kinds of poll results that really it's just one or two steps away from going, hey, I'd rather have my accounts with a private bank when they start to learn how DeFi works and really understands self-custody and they're capable of self-custody. Now there are scenarios that I think uh, wallets represent one of the biggest challenges in the industry because until we get to that stage where that becomes 
very simple for almost anyone. I think self-custody will still continue to be a challenge for only uh, the tech friendly and the people who are truly, really kind of engaged in all of this. Don't forget guys, make sure and hit like on the video. It's one of the things we do get in terms of feedback. We do want to get in um, more token analysis. So here's what our plan is, is to accelerate some of the videos. One of the things you hear me talk about here is in bear markets, uh, really there's two things that you can do to really prepare for the next generation. Uh, the first thing I think is education around not only finance in general, understanding uh, not only what the Fed's doing, how the Fed works, getting into the understanding of what and how the traditional Securities and Exchange Commissions, SEC, works. Also how trading works in the traditional markets, and that's in calls and puts. If you don't want to get into that, understand maybe you're just you know a limit order guy or a market order guy, that's fine. But really the next step, second step, is really going down the rabbit hole of cryptocurrencies and start to dive into educating yourself, not only on the tokens, but also on the protocols. What do they mean for the future of technology, whether it's Web3, gaming, metaverse, all those kind of things, depending on what you're, you know, you're into. Uh, maybe you're just a strictly, hey, I'm an investor. I just want to look at projects that move. Maybe you're a gamer and you're looking at uh, kind of playing to your passion, which is more on the game and metaverse side. Maybe you're an innovator, a brander, and that's something that appeals to you for metaverse and Web3. There's a lot there within what's happening overall. So I just suggest to you guys get into the traditional finance education, really start breaking that down and start doing deep dives uh, within uh, cryptocurrency and a lot of these projects. It's going to help you out in the long run as we start to move into the next bull run. Now, what I said is we're going to get into more token analysis. We used to do quite a few of these on the channel quite a bit. Obviously, the news cycle has increased dramatically during this bear run and the scenario is a great opportunity for you guys to start participating in the channel by letting us know the tokens and the projects that you really would like us to do deep dives on. Now, some of that may be interviews, which we do a lot now. Don't forget, tomorrow or Thursday, we have uh, the guys on with Helium uh, talking about their most recent update, which we've talked a little bit about on the show before, and that is their partnership with T-Mobile. That's a big one. Don't miss that CEO uh, deep dive. But we'll do these, um, these overview tokens uh, shows, so be on the lookout for those. We're going to try to get as many of those out per week to give you guys some insights on some projects that we're looking at long term. Um, the other thing, when you're really kind of moving to the next level, one of the things that I think we have to be uh, concerned with is looking at the overall market as it pertains to uh, where growth is coming from. This was a report overview on global uh, cryptocurrency exchange platforms. Market size valued at 30 billion. This was 2021 and expected to grow at a compound annual uh, rate of 27.8%. This is from 22 to 2030. Look at the growth here uh, in Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, Solana, others. But the point is, is the, the growth opportunity here, this looks a lot like traditional ex innovation markets in terms of Uptake. Now, the only way this grows like this is through institutional capital ingestion and also, obviously, to a certain extent, retail. And I think uh, we will see a new level of exchanges, whether it's a Robinhood style exchange and if it's FTX or Binance that moves in that direction. But I think one of them is going to get friendly with DC and we're going to start to be, see some really big movements uh, moving forward uh, for sure. Big stuff happening out there. Here's another thing when you want to look at international uh, space. This is another factor we talked about here on the show. This, of course, is Indian Exchange. Wazirex uh, follows Binance in delisting uh, USDC. Now, why is that important? As you guys know, I, I'm a big fan of USDC. Now, here recently, even though Robinhood is now listing USDC, which I think is a big deal in the fact that if they bring that in as the stable coin for the DeFi wallet, uh, as well as just within the exchange itself. If Robinhood gets past certain you know, limitations on withdrawals and things like that, that could be a real serious scenario. The other thing that Robinhood needs to do is really accelerate their blockchain uh, plugins and APIs because their transaction speeds from uh, on-chain transaction speeds are much lower and slower than uh, what I'm seeing when we test different platforms 
moving from, say, a Binance to uh, a hard wallet or a hard wallet to an FTX. Those kind of transactions, almost instantaneous. Um, Robinhood will need to jump on, on that and move it up to the next level. But what Wazirex is doing here uh, and following on this delisting, what it does is it starts to put a lot of pressure on USDC and maybe starts to position both Tether and also BUSD back into a scenario where there's some big opportunities. And you guys have heard me talk about this before. Here's an example. Users are now going to be able to view their USDC, USDP, and TUSD balances under the BUSD denominated account balance uh, when the conversion is complete. Much like what we reported on with Binance at the end of the month, when you deposit USDC, it's going to just automatically convert to BUSD, Binance Stablecoin. And I think this is a factor that is starting to play out in a lot of the places around the world. It hasn't necessarily played out here. Obviously, Circle, a U.S. company, this will be very interesting because there could be a little bit of a tug of war happening right now uh, as we start to see the space move on. Now, when you think of tug of war, you also have to look at this. Australian senator proposing a crypto bill targeting China's digital yuan. So again, this gets back into two factors that we've talked about here on the show before in terms of trying to get into a stable coin and or a CBDC from a global perspective, there's really two players in town. That's the United States and China. China has moved aggressively into the space, obviously, of, of moving a lot of hash rate out of China, even though there's still a lot there. But they also lost a lot of mining into the U.S., and they launched their CBDC, the digital yuan. Um, the other opportunity is that the United States has not necessarily gone there, even though Fed now and what that payment system might look like, it's not truly... Um, the next level for a stable product coming out of the U.S. government. So that in itself, I think, really starts to represent a very unique scenario that may be starting to play. And of course, Aussie, uh, part of the G5, starts to get into it and uh, controlling what they're doing. A couple of things that uh, I wanted to highlight here. This is the guy's digital asset market regulation bill 2022. It identifies seven Chinese banks, including um, the ABC, uh, the Bank of China, uh, that all have branches in Australia that can potentially facilitate the use of the digital yuan in the country. So the bill is now establishing disclosure requirements that uh, really kind of regulates those banks into be able not to use the digital yuan and go with the Australian dollar, which I think is, again, gets back to how uh, countries will continue to protect their sovereign uh, entity in terms of fiat. And I think this is one that could start to put a little bit of a hamper on China. We're going to take a look at this because I'm often looking at China and really kind of their growth overall, even though they are having somewhat of a meltdown on the real estate market. Uh, that in itself kind of represents some different challenges, which we'll talk about on more of a global and macro side of things when we get some of our macro analysts in here uh, on this. Last up, and then we'll get into some questions and to our poll. This is a video audio clip, I should say, of Alex Mashensky and what he was talking about in terms of Celsius and whether or not they are trying to pull out of bankruptcy. But I want you guys to listen to this statement from Alex. Celsius and everybody else who uh, was stuck in the same uh, situation. But my point is to to Oren's, uh, to what Oren was saying before is that, that um, obviously we provided a, a needed service and we grew faster then we could we could manage. We have an opportunity now to reorganize. And uh, I want to stress that, uh, uh, like, how many how many of you got, uh, use uh, drink Pepsi versus Coca Cola? At least a third pre drinks Pepsi. Raise your hand if you drink. Here we go. We see a few people. Well, Pepsi filed for bankruptcy twice. Right? Uh, does it make the Pepsi taste less good? Right? Delta filed for bankruptcy, right? Do you not fly Delta because they filed for bankruptcy? So the point is, is not a bankruptcy filing is a test for the company. It's a test of should you come out or should you disappear? And if you want to know if we should come out, just go and join any of the Twitter spaces or Reddit or other channels in which the Celsius community is talking to each other about Celsius. All right, uh, Zach. All right, so what, what he's talking about here is trying to resurrect the plan to bring Celsius back from the dead. 
And part of it is, is that, hey, there's a lot of companies that have gone bankrupt. There's a lot of companies that have been in reorg and it didn't really affect their brand overall. I disagree with this in the sense that most of those companies were not financial asset companies and they definitely were not holding people's life savings and then dealing with them in the way in which Celsius has done. Additionally, most of those companies that went bankrupt, sure, there were bad mistakes, but they were mistakes with their brand, not necessarily with other people's money. And I think that in itself, the only reason that I think that the Celsius community is pro Celsius to return is so they can get their money back, get their money out of this uh, situation. But I think Celsius is uh, long term. I would be very surprised if this brand ever comes back. But the point is, is that with all of what we're seeing on a global stamp uh, standpoint of banks trying to go into this direction, the regulatory scenario is playing into this. I don't think people are going to give this company or others like it a second chance. Now, we will be hearing soon on what's happening over at Voyager and what will be rolling out in terms of the uh, auction and who won that. Uh, I know, you know, obviously leaks have talked about FTX kind of being on the lead end of this. It will be interesting to see how that auction played out in comparison to FTX original offer, which uh, Voyager actually poo-pooed and said, hey, this is, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, kind of a low ball in chem coming in in a knight in shining armor uh, approach. So we'll, we'll stay up on all that good stuff for you guys. Definitely jump into that. I know you guys have some questions. We'll try to get in some of those. And then uh, I think we have a poll in here as well. All right. So will Robinhood swallow Coinbase retail users once the no uh, fee DeFi wallet is released? Here we go. Wow. 50-50. Yes, Coinbase favors institutions. No, Coinbase branding is too powerful. So again, you kind of saw the chart there at the beginning of the show where even though the rates were decent, I mean, not compared to free, but if you look at when you get into major uh, scenarios, and I think that's the big question is institutions will guide a lot of the growth. It's where most of the assets are going to be rolling through. Uh, but at the same time, I think we'll see a lot of retail environment and possibly the new uh, entry point for a lot of the millennials and a lot of Gen Z is going to be Robinhood in the crypto space. So we're going to be watching this one really closely. Robin could be Robinhood could be a real uh, interesting player here. I don't necessarily think that strategically that they'll play out. I think eventually they get acquired by somebody for sure. Let's jump over here to some questions from you guys. <clears throat> okay, Alex, let's look here. Digital Yuan, uh, stay in chat. I think, yes, overall, there is a negative connotation around the digital Yuan. I just don't know that many people understand the struggle that's going on right now between <clears throat> what's happening in China from a digital um, currency space as opposed to the race that the United States is trying to place in right now. Because I think there is a race happening. It may not be publicized as much, but it's definitely happening. All right, Joey, um, Coinbase institutional uh, dominant or will Coinbase also win the retail user race? Joey, I don't, if, if they don't get to a free, which you're talking about, no way that's happening. I don't know that they win the retail space. Now, the one that I think probably does win retail is probably going to be Binance or FTX. Now, Binance is doing a lot of zero trading fees. They do it right now with uh, Bitcoin. And I think that CZ is going to continue to move in that direction because he's going to run on innovation. And innovation around different products and financial assets, different solutions, different services that will start to enable where, much like Robinhood, is doing and being able to get down to a zero trading fee. I think that's going to be a big factor here. Colin coming in. Paul, I believe most progressive governments will all want CBDC just to keep control of the money, data, etc. Any thoughts? Absolutely. It, they definitely want it. Um, the problem is how do they get there? Because you're talking about something that has to replace an entire fiat system in a matter of probably a decade, because that's about what it would take, uh, maybe 15 years. And within that period of time, innovation and blockchain are not going to be standing still. So you're going to continue to see the ramp ups. And the, the thing you should watch for are the emerging countries because they are going to be the ones who take the route that is most proven. And the most proven route so far, and at least to this point, has been blockchain. And I think that's why you saw El Salvador and you'll see many others 
kind of move in this direction, especially as we start to get to this next bull run uh, for sure. BNB safer than ETH right now. Uh, Patrick, I'm kind of betting on both right now. I will say that I hold both BNB and Ethereum. I will tell you this. I am looking at trying to position better with BNB right now than Ethereum because I do think ETH is going to see a little bit of fall off. And I do think BNB will as well in this next downturn. A lot is going to be happening around the FOMC meeting tomorrow. We will be live streaming that, so make sure. And uh, we'll put up a, a thumb and let you guys know. So hit the notify button. If you are not subscribed, get subscribed to the channel. Uh, hit that notify button. It will give you a notification when we go live at 2 o'clock. So don't, don't miss that one. I think that's going to be a big tell on the market. Could be the biggest FOMC meeting of the year because of the spread that we've had since summer, the report what's been happening with the CPI and the regulatory environment along with the political stage that is queuing up right now for the midterms. Very interesting because remember, the next FOMC, after the elections in November. We won't see one in October. So watch out for that. Uh, Leighton, uh, Binance, uh, not in bed with the right people. FTX are in bed with the right people, institutions, and so on. FTX prime for a massive run. Okay, so you're back onto the point that I was getting at earlier is, is the key here, the Binance will always have a problem in the United States because of their origins. Um, the fact that we see a company that will have to face Washington in a different way. Now, it also could be a segue for uh, the U.S. to possibly re-engage trade with China, which could open up some different aspects of what Asian companies truly are in terms of their acceptance levels. But to your point, Sam Bankman-Fried is definitely in the right circles in DC. And believe me, when it comes to not only lobbying, but understanding how uh, votes go and how regulations are started, being in the right circles in DC is a very important thing. So CZ, I think, is behind the ball there, but he's ahead of the ball in innovation. And the markets typically will let innovation win now because they won't necessarily give a, a you know a competing advantage to one or the other because of the constituents and the pressure that you see from the public so i'm still kind of on the fence on that but i do think that fdx will be a big player uh coming soon some stake uh thank you paul for the deep dive what are your thoughts on leverage trading in this market uh just started about a week ago and i've gotten liquidated four times uh some growing pains for for right now, leverage trading is very risky. Um, you need solid positions and you need the ability to really uh, try. What I would do is go on and uh, do some practice trading first, uh, whether you're using tools like, you know, Bybit or Femix or others like that. Do some practice trading or just some in general. Uh, here's where I would enter a trade. Here's the leverage I would use if you are going to go in that direction. It's not something I do. But uh, I think the, the key here right now is swing trading. If you're going to try to uh, trade on swings, I do think we're going to see a little bit of a run here on Bitcoin after the FOMC because we will see a 75, or at least I'm feeling that. Uh, but I think a lot of this is priced in. The real question will come in how Chair Powell answers questions after he does the announcement. That's going to be a very, very critical statement. So make sure and watch the live stream on it. Thanks for the super chat. Uh, thoughts on rumors here. FTX and SBF with certain players to get rid of all decentralized exchanges, DeFi and peer-to-peer. -peer. Well, I, that would be almost impossible to try to get rid of all the, I mean, it could is someone have an evil plan? Sure, I think everybody would love to see that in, in the sense that if they're an FTX, you know, uh, an FTX entity, but I don't know. I don't, I don't think that you can do that in crypto. I think crypto is too far moved into society in too many different ways, too many different countries. I think um, I think DeFi is, is going to be here to stay for sure. Possibly even more accelerated in our next bull run for sure. Coming in from C3, uh, BUSD is a heavy competitor. CZ and Binance are still in the race. I agree. Uh, last one up here, Jeff. Uh, Paul, has been so much debate on exactly how long the bear market will drag on. Some analysts see some recovery happening next year. So others say more like 18 to 24. You know, there's a couple of things that I've talked about here on the show many, many times is Q3, Q4. Uh, to me, these next two quarters set the tone for the current recession, uh, fourth quarter especially. 
when we start to see uh, fourth quarter numbers on jobs, real estate, and also the S&P 500, as well as just in general, how this is going to play out from the Fed. If you look at the Fed interest rates, the interest rate right now, to be able to get to the achieved level, they're still talking about hikes all the way through the end of next year. So now, sure, they may be very small, you know, could always go down to even, you know, 10 basis points. Um, but the likelihood is we're going to continue to see these kind of pressures until the Fed gets uh, inflation under control. And that's a big challenge that I think they are really uh, going to be faced with right now. If you listen to Gareth Soloway and myself when we do our Mondays, um, we're both kind of in that camp is that it is going to be latter 23, which is a good setup for 24. Remember, election happening, railing past the scenario where the, con- the country and the globe maybe has corrected. Hopefully, we've got a Ukraine solution. And a lot of this, I think, does play out into the latter half of next year. Granted, there's going to be a lot of trades in between that time, so don't don't get lost in it. Remember what I said, education, deep dives on projects, because positioning now in some of these lower floor entry points is huge opportunities for upside, and that's what's going to make a lot of people millionaires, for sure. All right, you guys are tuned in over on the podcast right now. Make sure and tune in over here on the YouTube channel, because this is where we do all these deep dives, where we get into a lot of analysis. This is one of our more deep dives on how exchanges work. We are, as I said, going to be doing our token analysis a little bit more. We'll start bringing more price uh, projections and targets. Uh, We'll start doing a lot more of that. You guys will be ready for that. Uh, And of course, we do all of our live streams and a lot of our trading analysis as well. So it's all happening right here on the YouTube channel. If you guys want to reach me, catch me out there on Twitter. It's at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.